All right now we're uh, at the point uh, we're going to resume back talking about uh, black presence throughout the world and uh, in terms of the black Greeks. We already talked about the Ethiopians. He talked about the Eritreans. Uh, we talked about the black Palestinians and the black Iraqis and the black Iranians. Um, now we're going to talk about black Greeks. And in um, Joel, the book of Joel 3, 6, it says, the children, of, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from the border. So right here in, in the book of Joel, it talks about the children of Israel being sold to the Grecians. It's also in the book of Maccabees, uh, that's in the Catholic Bible, it talks about um, stuff going on in Greece with the Israelites. So just like when the Hebrews were enslaved by the Grecians in ancient Greece, um, the majority of jobs were performed by the, the slaves from Africa. This allowed citizens more time, the citizens of Greece more time to rest and work on their hobbies, such as creating art and music. Slavery in ancient Greece was similar to American slavery with one crucial difference. The people were not born into slavery. Sometimes parents sold their children to slavery because they could not afford to raise them. Other times prisoners captured during the war were forced into slavery. Once a slave, you were at, at your master's command. No marriages or children were allowed without their owner's permission. Uh, and, if, and if disobedient or insolent, an owner could hit a slave. So in Greece, in the mountains of Xanthi are those we all know as uh, you know, it's Pomax. Uh, these are Greek Muslims living in um, this area. Uh, while a little farther south towards the sea, a smaller and more particular community is that of black Greeks. And their existence remains unknown to the rest of Greece uh, and their historical origins and mystery. A lot of people have been trying to find, uh, solve the riddle about their origin. Uh, and just outside the city of Xanthi, uh, they live in harmony with other white populations, uh, these black Greeks. But fewer than a thousand people living along the entire stretch of the country, um, you know, are these black Greeks. And a lot of people say that they're descendants of slaves brought to Europe during the Ottoman Islamic era of slave trade. And the rest are immigrants from Africa. And as you can see here, the, the Greeks often call the first inhabitants of Greece uh, uh Pelasgians, and the Greek writers call, claim that the uh, Pelasgus, the great ancestor of the Pelasgians, was the first was the first man. As you can see here, the pictures of the Pelasgian boat from Thera, you can see the people on this boat are black, and they have short styled afros. If you look real closely, and the Greek historian Herodotus referred to the Pelasgians as uh, venerable ancestors. He said that the first Athenians. Uh, they were Pulaski, and they later possessed the country now designed uh, Hellas. And if you look at the uh, Taharka, the black uh, Dionysus, uh, which was uh, Egypt, was a Greek god, the black uh, Dionysus is seen here uh, with a pale-faced lady on this vase. And as you can see, everybody on this vase is black except for this pale-faced lady named uh, Rodolphus or Thea. And this also shows some more uh, pottery from 520 BC that shows that um, Athena appeared to be uh, a white female, but everybody around her was black. And as you see here, a black youth a statue in 300 BC. This is obviously the statue of a black uh, boy. This is 100 BC, another black uh, statue of a black boy. And 400 BC, a statue of another black boy and a black uh, Greek charioteer, as you can see by the hair texture as well. Uh, some people say that Socrates also was a black man. Here we see some uh, black black Greeks to this day, what they look like. Now, they have different accounts in, in 4th century BC um, where they tell of a city of CERN uh, located just outside the Pillars of Hercules, which was inhabited by Ethiopians. Now these are accounts were by a man named Hanno and another one called uh, Pelepatus. And in this city, it was, it was described as a market town where the uh, Carthaginians and the Ethiopians traded elephant tusk and hides, wine, perfume, 
Egyptian stones and Athen uh, Athen uh, Athenian pottery and skins of deer, uh, lions, and leopards. And the sizable population of blacks in ancient Rome uh, was demonstrated by the fact that on one occasion in, in 61 BC, Nero, uh, Emperor Nero, allied, o- allowed only blacks into the theater to watch 100 Ethiopian huntsmen perform. Right now, we right now even to today's time, we, there's black racism in Greece, uh, and people in Greece. Some of them are nicknamed uh, part of the group called the Greek Black Panthers, and the group uses cell phones and social media and, and neighborhood patrols to record any activity perceived as a threat uh, against them from the far right neo-Nazi Golden Dawn Party because they don't like black people out there in Greece. But Back then, associated with Greece was the ancient uh, Etruscan people who lived in uh, B.C., 400, 300 B.C. And as you can see here on the different pottery and sculptures that the Etruscan cities uh, and the, the pottery and sculpture were pictures of black people. And these cities were, uh, if not most of them, were older than Rome. By many people, many uh, ancient historians account. And here we see here the Etruscan man uh, with a Roman uh, dancer. And here we see another sculpture of an Etruscan, 500, 400 BC. And this is a, a black man, as you can see there. Here we have Turkey. In Turkey, we have black people in Turkey called the straight hair blacks. And as you can see, they're black in appearance with straight hair. Some of them look like, uh, this is like regular African Americans with uh, some type of... Uh, Moisturizer, creaming the hair to make their hair straight. And the Mori and the Berbers. Moris and the Berbers are known to be in North Africa as well as East Africa in the Afar ethnic tribe. And as you see here, these people are all black in appearance. Afar tribe was also known on East Africa uh, as well. Next to Ethiopia and was also even documented to be in the area known as Libya and Tunisia. Here you see pictures of them right there. And moving along the globe to Thailand, the Manny tribe of Thailand. The Manny people were the original peoples that came from Africa and settled in Thailand many years ago. They were the original Negritos who moved with other Africans like the Andamese uh, people of India, the the Adas of the Philippines, and the Semangs of Malaysia to their present residence in Thailand. Here goes pictures of them right here in the villages. And as you see, they're people of color. The sentence of the original people of Thailand. These are what the modern day Thailand people look like when you see see, uh, shows on TV. When you see anybody that says they're from Thailand, you're not going to see black, dark skinned people saying that they're from Thailand unless you go over there. And ancient um, Buddha statues in Thailand in 800 AD shows that uh, Buddha had uh, thick lips and hair. Uh, of that of a Negro, or curly, kinky hair. Filipinos, uh, the ancient, uh, original Filipinos were called Negritos, or the Eta people. And as you see in the villages here, they are all black with woolly hair and afros. They were also called the Orang Asli, and Orang Asli meant original people because they were the original inhabitants of the Philippines, the natives uh, called the Negritos. And as you can see here, they are black in appearance. Uh, look just like uh, uh, African Americans and Africans. They live in the villages, in the mountains now, because when the Spaniards came, they uh, dominated the country, they changed the language, they changed the face and skin color of the people over time. But the people who were the natives of the land that were there first, uh, they didn't want to have this colonization and influence in their culture and language, so they migrated into the villages, into the into the forests, and into the mountains. And as you can see here, they are people of color. Just you would think that they are in Africa, but they're not. They're in the Philippines. As you can see here, these are a, a family, a village of Filipinos. And some of them have more of an African look. Some of them have more of an Asian look. Some of them have a mixed Asian African look. But as you can see, all of them have brown skin, meaning they have melanin in their skin, because it came. Uh, from the root from where they originally came from. And a lot of white explorers, they come and they come with their cameras and videos and they take pictures because they're amazed to see 
these black tribes of people called the Negritos living in the Philippines, which we normally think as being Asian, all Asian. More pictures there. The Asian features, however, are also seen in Africa with the sand uh, people in uh, parts of East and South Africa. As you can see, the epicanthal folds of the eyes, which gives the, the Asians that, that slit look appearance, is also found in African tribes in Africa, as you can see here. And these are all people of color, and they have high cheekbones, uh, like some of the Asians as well. Now, the sand Bushman tribe of Africa, they're indigenous people of South, Southern Africa, uh, whose territory spans most areas of South Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique, Swaziland, Botswana, Na uh, uh, Namibia, and Angola. They're referred to as Bushman, or San, or Shu, or, or Basara, or Kung, or Kwei, and they are known to have the same Mongol slanted eyes, high cheekbone features of Asians uh, amongst the African tribes. As you can see here, as pictures, you can see the slanted eyes, the epicanthal folds, just 100% similar to the Asians, the high cheekbones, but yet they have kinky, curly, uh, what we would call nappy hair. Here we see some more pictures of them. A lot of Africans don't know that this, these people exist and that they have eyes just like Chinese people. But who came first? Well, the Africans came first. The Africans came first and the Chinese people are descendants of Africans. If you ask a true Chinese person that knows the history, they will tell you this. Here they are right here. Some more pictures. A lot of them are real tall. Some people say they're genetically they're the oldest people in the world. When you trace their DNA. Some more pictures again. The sand people and their Asian features. Dark skin tones. Black natives of Madagascar. Madagascar is off the coast of Africa. These people are also black. Here we see right here. Off the coast where Mozambique is at. The people there, nobody, when you see the movie Madagascar, the cartoon, nobody ever shows any pictures of black people. Nobody even knows that the people of Madagascar the natives are black. A lot of people will say that the Asians were black and people don't believe, but yes, uh, there were blacks in ancient China. The, skele the skeletal remains from southern China are predominantly found to be Negroid, and the people uh, practice single burials, which is an African ritual. In northern China, the blacks found in many civilizations. Three major empires in China at the time were the Zia dynasty, the Shang, Yin dynasty, and the Zhu dynasty. The Zhu dynasty was the first dynasty founded by the Mongoloid people in China called the Hua. Hua. And the founders of the Zi and Shang dynasty came from the fertile African crescent by way of Iran. Now, Chinese civilization began along the Yellow River. And here the soil was fertile and black. Uh, Chinese farmers grew millet. 4,000 years ago in later soybeans. They also raised pigs and cattle. And in uh, 3500 BC, the blacks in China were raising silkworms and making silk. Back then, the, Qin, the Qin and Ming dynasty was also known to have black Chinese people. And here we see a Chinese uh, soldier in 200 BC with uh, black features. Here we see, a lot of people probably think this, this, this picture is, is not uh, real, but this is the black Chinese person, blacker than uh, some African Americans and here as you can see here no this picture is not photoshopped these are actual Asians uh, that are just as dark or if not darker than many African Americans in America today and you ask them how they get this color it's not because of the sun because Chinese people and Indians and white people also live in areas where it's hot uh, near the equator but they are not this color because this color uh, comes from melanin which comes from the original man here we see another Chinese person with uh, skin color. He's not white. And we see here another uh, a black woman with Chinese-looking eyes. And that we talked about is from South Africa. And they look just like Chinese people because they got color. So the Pacific Islanders originally lived in uh, Africa and southern China. Uh, these, these Chinese people that look black were called the East Yi, the Nan Yi, the Man, uh, Man Yi, the Kunlun Yi and the Shang Shen Ling. Genghis Khan, who was the most successful leader of the Mongolian Empire and united, united the Mongolian tribes, was a descendant of the Yi and was also considered to be a black Chinese. 
Here we see pictures of the black Buddha in the Olmec uh, stones you see below here. In the Olmec stone heads in Mexico, uh, Olmec heads, heads are around, found around uh, 600 BC in Mexico, and they bear striking similarities to uh, ancient uh, Chinese culture, so much so that they sit now, one of the uh, Olmec headstones sits in Century Park in Shanghai. But what is baffling is that the ancient Olmec mode of writings from 600 BC on the stones in Mexico was exactly the same as the Shang writings in China in 1000 BC. So if you look at right here, the Olmec uh, script writings compared to the Shang writings, you will see that they are exactly the same, but they're in a totally different area of the world. One's in China, one's in Mexico. As you can see there, uh, the words for 10 and worship, two, three, container, temple building, as you can see, they're exactly the same. Here we see here Century Park in Shanghai, uh, China. Here there is uh, the Olmec headstone sitting there, and they, uh, they give even some information about the Olmec headstone in China uh, and, and where it came from. So recent discoveries in the field of linguistics and other methods have shown, without a doubt, that the ancient Olmec head statues of Mexico, known as the Z people, which some people believe came from China by way of West Africa. And they were of Mende African ethnic stock. It's easy to see the Negroid African facial features on the statues if you look at it. As you can see here, you can see the big lips, the big lips and the wide nose, and the facial appearances that are similar to the, to that of a, of a person of black descent or Negroid descent. In comparison to uh, black people, you can see the striking uh, resemblance in lips and nose. Here again, picture A and picture B. And studies were done by a man named Clyde Winters, which showed that the Olmecs uses, used the same Mende script that was used among uh, the Mendicas and other Africans in West Africa. Now, when the writings on the Olmec monuments were translated, it was found that the language spoken by the Olmecs was actually the West African Mende language. And they used the Mende uh, writing script. And the Olmecs also had a religious practice of thunder worship where the axe was a prominent feature. Now, going back to West Africa with the Mendi people, the axe was also a prominent feature in connection with the Shango or Thunder God worship. Both the Olmecs and the Shango worshipers in West Africa placed emphasis on the religious significance of children in their religious practices. Now, interesting is the similarities in the name Shango uh, worshipers of West Africa who were linked to the Olmecs and the Shang dynasty. The African hairstyles such as cornrows are found on many of the Olmec uh, uh, statues found in Mexico. Both kinky hair carved into one of the colossal stone heads of basalt, as well as the cornrow style wearing uh, tassels um, have been found. And here we see these pictures again. These pictures are over 2,000, 3,000 years old. A lot of people don't know this, uh, pictures of Buddha was found in Kenya. The statues of Buddha was found in Kenya. Now, the Africans or blacks that founded the civilization in China were also called the Li Men people, which, which meant black-headed people by the Zhu dynasty. Now, the term has affinity to the Sumerian Akkadian term sa ge ga which means black-headed people. And these Li Men people were associated with the Chinese cultural Hero Yah. And you can see here in the picture the Kenyans, people in Kenya have this huge Buddha statue. Now, what is the Buddha statue that the Chinese and the Asians uh, uh, worship? Why is that in Kenya? Why is it in Africa? Where did it originate from? Did it originate in Africa first or did it originate in Asia? And here we, here we see the uh, Dravidian Indians. The Dravidians were uh, among perhaps the first people to inhabit India. Their language is original, uh, dating back to ancient Sanskrit, Sanskrit uh, script. In the early, Greeks and Romans referred to the Dravidian dark Indians as Eastern Ethiopians. The term Ethiopian was the Greek word that meant people with faces burnt by the sun. And so there were Eastern Ethiopians and Western Ethiopians. Western Ethiopians were the ones that were most notably known as Africans. 
And the East, Eastern Ethiopians were in Asia, and they were dark in skin color. As you can see here, the Dravidian dark Indian. Here we see a picture of a North Indian family who have more European looks because their uh, descendants intermixed over years with uh, the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and the British that invaded North India. And the, the original Indians moved further south because they didn't want to be uh, touched by these uh, neighboring uh, invaders, European invaders, and their culture and their language. And later they would be called the Untouchables or the Dali. Uh, these are, this is a South Indian family. As you can see, they're dark, resembling more of African uh, root. Here, uh, the white lady is here. She's with the Dravidian dark Indians, and they, some of them look, actually look like uh, um, black kids or mixed black kids. This is the map of the Dravidians living in South Central and Northeast India. You can see here, the skin complexion is, is uh, similar, if not the same as black people. And if you was to cover up the hair, you probably even couldn't be able to tell the difference unless you were really good with looking at facial structures. This is an old, uh, modern, uh, old picture of a Dravidian girl in southern India, and she looks like a black girl with a perm. And you see another here, another Dravidian Indian, and she looks just like it, somebody's old black grandma, except for she has the, the kind of uh, necklace and uh, earrings that Indians wear. Some more pictures of Dravidian Indians right here with their dark skin complexion. Again, going back to, to their roots uh, from ancient Africa, Mesopotamia. A lot of people say that uh, Madai and, and, uh, uh, and Elam uh, were the forefathers of the Dravidian people. Um, Elam was the first son of Shem and was the father of Abraham and the Hebrews. And the Elamites were a significant people uh, until 800 BC in Persia, which is modern Iran. Uh, it's said by many historians that the Dravidian Indians are descendants of the Elamites and the Persians, or Medes, or Madai, in the genealogy of Shem. And as we saw earlier, the Elamite warriors and Persian warriors back in those days were black. In Iran, Iran is right next to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. So you only would think that all they had to do was migrate a little bit further to the east. And this is the reason why we have dark-skinned Indians in that section of the world. And these pictures, like I said, you can, they can be found in King Darius's plas uh, palace. It sits right now in uh, a museum in Paris, France. And was uh, from South Iran. It's also in the book of Daniel 11, 1, Daniel 8, and Ezra 4, 9. Dravidian uh, yogis back in the day, central India, with dreadlocks. And you would think the only black people have dreadlocks, but these ancient Indians, uh, dark skinned Indians, also had dreadlocks too, just like uh, people from Jamaica and, and uh, in America. Showing you the resemblance of skin complexion with those of Africans as well. In uh, Jambor, Indi uh, Jambor, India, you have uh, the cities. Cities are, uh, the name city is basically just like, basically saying black person in India. And as you can see here, mostly everybody in the background are black. Some of them with woolly hair. This is in India. A lot of people don't know that the cities are descendants of slaves in western India. Uh, today's Indian states of uh, Jugarat and uh, Maharashtra. The city has gained a reputation as being physically powerful and fiercely loyal. They made, uh, this made them popular amongst the local princes and mercenaries. And in the 17th century, uh, there was a large influx of the cities. As many were, uh, were brought to India, uh, sold by Muslims and, Hindu, uh, Muslims and Hindus, uh, kings and Portuguese slave traders. Despite their reputation as good fighters, the cities, many were used as domestic service and farm laborers. And some city slaves escaped into the forest to form their own communities. And the ancestors of the present-day cities of southern um, Baluchistan and Karachi and Pakistan were slaves from Tanzania, Kenya, and Zanzibar, brought by the Omani Arabs. 
Now, some Indian cities are descendants from uh, uh, Tanzanians and Mozambicans brought by the po Portuguese. Now, the city is descended from slaves. Uh, they live within their own tightly knit community. And most of them live in the Sindhi uh, region of Pakistan and the uh, Jugarat region of India. And some have mixed in with the local Indian people and they have adopted the Indian religion of uh, Muslim, Hindu, or Buddhism. Here we go, some pictures, as you can see. And some of them had the dot on their forehead uh, showing how they eventually uh, uh, adopted the religion of the land that they were enslaved into. The Andamans, Andaman, uh, Andaman people of India, a lot of Indians don't even know that these people exist, uh, are black with uh, nappy tight curled hair. And this place, the Andaman Islands, is a district of India located in the southern eastern part of the Bay of Bengal. And as you can see here, their pictures, you uh, they are darker than a lot of Africans that are even living in Africa, and they have African Negroid hair. But nobody would know it. Nobody knows how they got there. People have all types of speculations. And to some, they're known as the darkest people in the world, even darker than some of the Dravidian Indians in South India. Um, but still, however, the Dravidians and Andaman, uh, Andaman people that live in India are still viewed negatively as non-human. Uh, even uh, Mohandas Gandhi had different stereotypes uh, about blacks in India. And he said that uh, kafirs or blacks, are as a rule uncivilized. The convicts are even more so, and they are troublesome, very dirty, very dirty, and live almost like animals. And this is what uh, Mohandas Gandhi had said about uh, kafirs, which is another word for blacks. Here's some pictures of uh, the Andaman people similar in complexion to the Dravidian Indians uh, right here and some more pictures of the Andaman people from the Andaman Islands a lot of times uh, different explorers mostly European Caucasians will come here and they're fascinated to the fact that they're still uh, running around tribal uh, wearing hardly nothing and some people said that back in the day they also practiced cannibalism and they are fascinated when they see anybody come from uh, uh, land that they're, uh, that they're not from and depending on whatever they bring as you can see here the map it shows the Andaman Islands right here smack dab kind of like in the middle of Bay of Bengal a little across from Sri Lanka and next to Thailand and below India people of South Asia the Tamil people are also black in appearance as you can see here Muslim religion uh, Hindi religion, Buddha religion, Buddha, Buddhism religion is, is prominent there. And here we see some black Japanese people on, from the Ainu uh, tribe, Ainu elders, black Japanese with woolly hair. The Ainu people of Japan are the in, indigenous people of Japan in Far East Russia. Although the true number of Ainu descendants living in Japan is, is not known, it's believed that only 200 pure blood Ainu remain most of these upon J Japan's north, uh, northernmost island of Hokkaido. Here we see the Dani and Lani people of Indonesia. The Dani people also spelled uh, the Dani with an N and sometimes conflated with the Lani group to the west are people from the central highlands of west, western New Guinea, the Indonesia province of uh, Papua. As you can see here, everybody in this picture is black, except for this lady right behind this man right here. This is in Indonesia. Indonesia uh, makes up a group of these uh, islands right here, right above uh, Australia, next to Malaysia, right below the Philippines. This is in the Pacific Islands. And they look like they could just be somebody's uh, black uncle or grandfather or father sitting on the couch you know, watching TV except for they're living in villages in the forces with spears and arrows and different types of um, <clears throat> headdresses these are black people over here in Indonesia scattered uh, been there for a long time and you can see here the pictures you can see their hair texture very similar to their African brothers over in Africa, hundreds and thousands of miles away. Malaysia, uh, the Baytek tribe of Malaysia, 
Also, indigenous people, currently numbering about 1,500. They live in the rainforest of uh, peninsular Malaysia. They're nomadic hunters and gatherers, and the exact location of their settlements change uh, within the general confines of the area that they inhabit. And they also are known as the orange, orange asli, which means original people in Malaysia. And, and that's what they identified, the people identified them with when uh, uh, outside invaders came and uh, saw these people. They, they labeled them uh, the term orange asli, which means original people. Uh, that's how they were first used to identify them when, they came, when settlers came to the land. And you see some more pictures of them with um, you know, woolly, uh, kinky hair, afros, dark skin. You see out the women of uh, the Baytech tribe are, are black in appearance, dark skin, uh, showing evidence of melanin. Whether or not their hair texture is, is curly or straight or afro in appearance, they still have that dark skin tone complexion, which is evident if you have melanin. And we see the uh, pictures of the ancient Fiji people. Uh, they're obviously black in appearance, with dark skin and, and woolly hair. Uh, this is a black and white, so you know this is an old picture. Interesting enough, the, in 2012, Miss Fiji, uh, she won uh, uh, Miss Universe, uh, uh, whatever those competitions are, and she uh, lost the crown because the natives of Fiji said that she looked too white and didn't look uh, indigenous to the, to the Fiji people who were black. And because of it, they took away her crown. This is her receiving the crown, and then they gave the crown to this lady right here. But she still doesn't look on, uh, indigenous to the land. And as you see here, Fiji is right next to uh, Samoa on the west. And then further to the east, you have Tahiti. And above to the north, you see Hawaii. And as you see here, there's pictures of uh, ancient the Fiji men back in those days with afros and brown skin color. You see some more pictures of a whole village of people uh, with African Afros, black skin, and they kind of dress and do th things similar to the Samoans and the Hawaiians with the torches and the flame and, and, this, and, uh, and the way they dress. Here we have a picture of the natives of Hawaii and Fiji in the 1890s. Um, these are the indigenous tribes. Some of the first pictures of the native people of Hawaii and Fiji show them in their traditional clothes, like I was talking about, which show their uh, social uh, standing. And as you can see here in the pictures, they, the way they wore their hair, um, uh, in a sort of like an Afro appearance, but with a different type of uh, uh, cut. So... The black natives in, of uh, Hawaii, white southerners um, who, settled in, uh, who settled the Hawaiian Islands during the 19th century had a, a song about the native people which ran, uh, which said, um, you may call them Hawaiian, but they look like niggers to me. So setting aside their bigotry, the southern settlers um, uh, hit upon the fact, which is studied, I mean, which is studiously ignored by uh, modern anthropologists and historians, the natives of Hawaii, uh, America's 50th state, were um, black people whose ancestral roots extend back to the continent of Africa. And this is the reason why the, um, the European explorers, when they got there, they uh, said that they were Hawaiian, but they still look like black people to them. Here we see pictures of uh, some of the uh, old black and white pictures of, of the natives of Hawaii uh, with uh, brown skin, and some of them with different uh, grains of hair, some of them even with uh, uh, Afro-style looking ha hairstyles. So the black Hawaiians in the 1800s, the first people to, to reach Hawaii were uh, blacks from Polynesia. Uh, the name Polynesia means many islands, uh, and it's in the Central Pacific. And they sailed to Hawaii in giant canoes about 2,000 years ago. So uh, the, the Hawaiians, the black people of Hawaiians, uh, uh, you know, when you, look, when you look at black people themselves, uh, a lot of black people are in different areas are uh, an ethnological puzzle. Uh, many um, black people that, that migrated to the Pacific uh, uh, Ocean Island area, like the Tasmanians, uh, were ex exterminated by English settlers. Uh, a lot of them were pure blacks. Uh, the Australian Aborigines were also very dark with African features and curly hair. Uh, the basic strain of the original Hawaiians, as seen in their color and their faces, um, 
uh, was wrote, written about by uh, historian J.A. Rogers in uh, his book Sex and Race, uh, Negro, Caucasian, Mixing in All Ages and All Lands. Uh, he noted that uh, Hawaiians, uh, original Hawaiians, was undoubtedly, undoubtedly Negro with a mixture of Mongolian uh, stock. And these people were of black and brown complexions with wavy or close curled hair, broad facial features, with fine physiques. In short, they had uh, the same physical characteristics as millions of other people who now live in the Pacific Islands. Um, and you can see that uh, when you look at the different pictures. Here's, here are some more pictures of the ancient uh, natives of Hawaii and Fiji. And as you can see, uh, they're a little bit uh, darker than what you would normally see now in Hawaii uh, when we watch TV. So they had a king, um, I'm trying to pronounce his name, King uh, Kamehama the Great. And he, uh, his uh, time frame where he lived was between, was between 1758 and 1819 AD. And he established uh, the Kingdom of Hawaii in 1810. And as you can see here, is the, he's a, a black man. It looks like a, a regular black man. And here they have a statue of him in Hawaii. So moving along uh, in the same area, we have the brown-skinned Samoans right here. And as you can see, they have that Pacific Island look. Uh, and they still uh, have evidence of brown skin. And in order to have brown skin, you've got to have melanin. Uh, some of the famous wrestlers in the WWE, WWF, uh, were Samoan. Uh, and the Rock is half Samoan, half black. And uh, the, the Uso brothers um, are also are Samoan, and you can see in their complexion that they don't have white skin. And that uh, goes all back to their ancestral roots to Africa. Here we see some more uh, Samoans playing uh, football or soccer, whatever, whatever you want to use. And you can see here, this uh, Samoan has uh, dreadlocks, so his hair texture is... Uh, curly enough to form uh, dreadlocks, something that uh, most ca Caucasians can't do unless they uh, backcomb or tease their hair or manipulate it. And as you can see, looking at both uh, uh, Samoan uh, or the Samoan player in black, you can see that he obviously has uh, uh, color in the skin, and a lot of them have their ancestral tribal tattoos, which they, uh, which the Hawaiians also do as well. Here you see some old black and white pictures of the Samoans, um, and as you can see, they are undoubtedly not Caucasian, and they have melanin in their skin, and they have brown skin complexions. Some more pictures here. Looking at the hair, you can obviously tell that, that their hair texture is a little bit different uh, than Caucasian European hair. So moving on forward to the Australia, Australian Aborigines, the original Australian Aborigines, the natives of Australia. Um, Australia was colonized by the British. We normally refer to them as Aborigines, people who, met, who um, ancestors were indigenous to the Australian continent, that is to mainland Australia or to the island of Tasmania, before British colonization of the continent, um, which began in 1788. The British would later impose uh, policies to depopulate and exterminate the natives of the land. Here we see some pictures of uh, the Aborigines. Some people think uh, that people with dark skin are only from Africa, but little do they know that the majority of people in the world have brown skin raging in different shades, just like uh, African Americans in, in USA. This is because the original man uh, that was started, Adam and Eve, um, were uh, started uh, with people of color, meaning they had melanin. Stolen generations of uh, Aborigines, as you can see here, when the um, British came and colonized the area, they uh, enslaved them in, in shackles and uh, exterminated them because they felt that they were an inferior race and that they needed to eliminate them and to, uh, you know, ensure the success of their colonization and their, um, their race in, in Australia. Just like uh, slaves from Africa, the Australian Aborigines were also enslaved, as you can see here, with chains around their neck, uh, also chained to one another. So in the 19th, early 20th, in the early 20th centuries, um, there were documents that indicated uh, 
the British uh, European policy of removing Aboriginal children from their parents, uh, and this would uh, help cause the decline of the Aboriginal people when the British arrived in the late 1700s. The British hoped that the Aborigines would die out and that the full-blood tribal Aboriginal population would be unable to sustain itself and was doomed to inevitable extinction. The British believed that the civilization of Northern uh, Europeans was superior to that of the Aborigines based on uh, comparative technological advancement and even believed that having mixed descent children of white slash Aboriginal DNA, uh, they lab labeled them half castes or crossbreeds or octoroons, would be a threat to the nature and plans of the British settlement of Australia. So in the 1930s, um, there's a doctor named Dr. Cecil Cook um, of the Northern Territory Protective Natives. He uh, perceived that the continuing rise in numbers of the of half caste children or ha half breed children of uh, Australia Aborigines and and whites was a problem. And he proposed a solution. Uh, this solution was basically uh, by the fifth and sixth generation of cross mixing. He believed that the native characteristics of the uh, Australian Aborigines were going to be eradicated. Um, and he said that the problem of our half caste or half breed would, would quickly be eliminated by the complete disappearance of the black race and the swift uh, submergence of uh, their progeny in the white. So I guess he believed that uh, over time with mixing uh, white uh, DNA with the aboriginal black DNA that he believed by the fifth and sixth generation the blackness of the generational children, half-breed children, would be gone and that they would be completely white. Now, similarly, the chief protector of, of the Aborigines in Western Australia, uh, A.O. Neville, wrote an article uh, for the West Australia in the 1930s in it, which he said, uh, eliminate in future the full blood of the Aborigines and the white will remain. Eliminate the full blood and permit the white in mixture and eventually the race will become white. Uh, this is interesting because a lot of uh, certain uh, Jews today that will admit that the original Hebrew Israelites were black, sometimes they will say that when the Hebrews uh, migrated, uh, when the Hebrews had the second temple destroyed in Solomon's Temple in 70 AD, they believed that all of the Hebrew Israelites uh, migrated up north to Europe and that he, they eventually started to uh, intermix with the European white race and that the blackness of the original Hebrews was eradicated. And that's why the European Jews from Europe, when they came to Israel in 1948, they were all European white looking. And this is actually what some uh, Jewish people believe, is that the blackness of the original Hebrews was eradicated with constant race mixing. And we all know that's uh, false. So they... So different uh, people back then uh, all talked about uh, genocide and trying to get rid of the uh, uh, Australian uh, black aborigines. Uh, but they weren't fully successful. But the question is, why were the Europeans always intent on eliminating the blackness out of the indigenous tribal uh, uh, black people of the many lands that they colonized? And here we see pictures right here of different Aborigine, Ab, uh, Australia uh, Aborigines, old and young man and woman. As you can see here, uh, their dark complexions, similar to Africans, African Americans, and all black people scattered across the world. And you can see here the, the different hair textures in the family pictures, similar to African Americans in our different hair textures. Now, there's a little small island off of Australia called uh, Tasmania, and these are pictures of the, uh, the original Tasmanians. However, they were all exterminated um, by uh, the Europeans. And in December 1st, 1826, the Tasmanian Colonial Times declared uh, this in their paper, that uh, the government must remove the natives of Tasmania. If not, they will be hunted down like wild beasts and destroyed. So back in those days, they issued out laws to destroy and kill off all the black Aboriginal uh, Tasmanians. Um, they themselves were tight uh, curled hair people with skin complexions ranging from brown 
I'm mean, the black to reddish brown. And they were relatively uh, short in stature with very little bo- body fat. They were indigenous uh, people to the land. In their arrival, um, a lot of them date were, uh, was thousands and thousands of years ago. Now, um, when the Europeans came, uh, the Dutch came to the Tasmanian coast in 1642, they originally named the island Van Diemen's Land after Anthony Van Diemen. Diemen. Uh, he was the governor and general of the uh, Dutch East Indian Company. And the island continued to be called that until 1855. But as early as uh, 1804, the British began to slaughter, kidnap, and enslave the black people of Tasmania. The colonial government itself was not even inclined to consider the aboriginal Tasmanians as full human beings. And scholars began to discuss civilization as an unlinear process with white people at the top and black people at the bottom. To the Europeans, just like in Australia, the Tasmanian blacks were an entity fit only to be exploited in the most sadistic of matters. Uh, And they did a lot of... uh, uh, things that were uh, morally unjust and, un- and not right to them, and so they had tactics. They had tactics for hunting down Tasmanians, which included riding out on horseback to shoot them. They set out steel traps to catch them, and they put them in uh, prisons and they poisoned them, uh, poisoned their flour, uh, so that when they found a the flower and they ate it, that they would die. And a lot of times, they often cut off the men, uh, their uh, penis and testicles, and then they watched the men run a few yards before dying. And so during that time, they slaughtered many Tasmanians and they threw their bodies over the cliff. And it um, documented that one party of police at one time killed 70 Tasmanians and uh, even bashed out their brains in the process. However, not a single European, however, was ever punished for this, uh, the crimes that they did against the, tra- the Tasmanian Aborigines. So the Europeans thought that, that nothing was going to be done and nothing needed to be done with this kind of abuse and they also thought nothing when they tied the black uh, Tasmanian men to trees and they used them for target pra- practice the Tasmanian women were kidnapped, chained and exploited as sexual, sexual slaves during the time and they used them uh, as sport and they would shoot them and spear them and club, club the men to death and torture and they would also rape the women and there was even reports that they roasted uh, the black uh, Tasmanian children alive. And a historian named James Morris, he graphically noted um, these accounts and said that um, we hear of children kidnapped as pets or servants or a woman chained up like an animal in a shepherd's hut or men castrated to keep them off of uh, their own woman. And one day, 70 Aborigines were killed, the men shot, the women and children dragged from crevices in the rocks to have their brains bashed out. A man named Carrots, uh, desiring a native woman, uh, decapitated her husband and hung his head around her neck and drove her home to his shack. So these are the kind of practices that the Europeans were, did to the uh, black natives of Tasmania. And they even declared a black war uh, against uh, Van Diemen's land. And it was an official campaign of terror directed against the black people of Tasmania between 1803 and 1830, the, the black aborigines of Tasmania were reduced from an estimated 5,000 people to less than 75. Um, they declared martial law in 1828, and whites, um, British whites were authorized, or European whites were authorized to kill blacks on sight. And although the black Tasmanians, uh, they offered a heroic resistance, uh, the wooden clubs and, and the sharpened sticks of the aborigines were no match against the firepower uh, ruthlessness and savagery exercised by the Europeans against them. And uh, in that time, they had a bounty was declared on them, and they uh, called it black catching. And it became a big business, and they were awarded five pounds for each adult aborigine and two pounds for a child. So uh, throughout all this killing, finally on May 7th, 1876, the last full-blooded black Tasmanian, uh, her name was True uh, uh, Ganini, uh, she died at the age of 73 years old. And it's reports that her mother had been stabbed to death by a European and that her sister was kidnapped by Europeans and that her intended husband was drowned by her two by two Europeans in her presence uh, while his murderers raped her at the same time. And here's a picture of her, the last full-blooded black Tasmanian. 
was exterminated in 1876, and there are no longer any black Tasmanians living on the the, uh, the island of Tasmania off of uh, Australia. Now, the black people of Melanesia, as we can see here by these pictures, they have uh, tight curled hair, and they have the hair um, style in a sort of Afro uh, type of style. Melanesia in Greek means black islands and is a region extending from the western side of the eastern Pacific Ocean, north and northeast of Australia. It consists of 2,000 islands with a total land area about 308,000 uh, square miles. Home to about 2 million people and they've been inhabited by tens of thousands of years, for about tens of thousands of years by brown black people, some of whom even have blonde hair. And here we see pictures, the map of uh, Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, and along these islands, uh, in, in close vicinity, you have uh, the Philippines, you have New Guinea, and you have Fiji, and Tonga, and the uh, Samoa. And uh, a little over, you see at the top, you see Hawaii and New Zealand, uh, right off to the uh, east of uh, Australia. Here you see the Melanesian people, uh, looking just like the day are from, you know, the island of Jamaica or any of the Caribbean islands with dreadlocks. Some of them even have blonde hair. A lot of them have blonde hair, uh, the ones that live on the Solomon Islands. Uh, and this is, a lot of times, it baffled a lot of, uh, baffled a lot of people because they always believed that blonde hair was a trait of Caucasians, uh, same as um, blue eyes. But um, these people of color obviously have the genetic component to have blonde hair, no matter what uh, uh, shade of skin color that they exhibit, as you can see here. Pictures of the Melanesians. Different, uh, as you can see, different skin shades, uh, complexions of the people there, ranging from uh, light brown to dark uh, brown complexion different hair textures as well. A lot of times uh, uh, explorers will come visit these islands and be fascinated by the people living there, that they're black and a lot of them have uh, blonde hair and their uh, facial features and their look, which is uh, different uh, on the different many islands of the Pacific uh, Islands. Now the black people of New Guinea, Papua, New Guinea is the world's uh, second largest island after Greenland. Uh, human presence of uh, the island dates back at least 40,000 years to the oldest human migrations out of Africa. Now, the 16th century Spanish explorers discovered the island and called it uh, Nueva Guinea. After that, the Europeans, the Dutch, Spanish, British, and Germans came to colonize and take over the land of the black natives. And as you see here, uh, the people of uh, New Guinea are black, the natives. And explorers and people like to travel, they come and they see the people in these villages and they try to learn their culture. As you can see here, you can obviously see their hair texture is of Negroid appearance. They have the Huli people who live in the central mountains of Papua, uh, Papua New Guinea. And you can see how they, how they uh, cut their hair. So you can only imagine uh, how their hair texture is if they're able to do this to their hair. Now we move along to Mexico. Now we have a guy named Gaspar Yanga, uh, often just named Yanga. He was a leader of a slave rebellion in Mexico during the early period of Spanish uh, colonial rule in the 1500s. As you can see here at the bottom, it says El Ganga. He was famous. Uh, down in Mexico, they also have Afro-Mexicans who are an ethnic group uh, which consists of uh, certain parts of Mexico such as the Costa Chica of uh, uh, Oaxaca and Guerrero, Veracruz, and in some towns in northern Mexico. The existence of blacks in Mexico is unknown. Nobody knows about it. Denied and is de and, or diminished in both Mexico and abroad for a number of reasons. Uh, they are a smaller number and they uh, also, in, you know, have heavy, heavy or high rates of inter intermarriage with other ethnic groups, ethnic groups, and Mexico's tradition of defining itself as a 
uh, Mestaja J, or a mixing of European and indigenous people of the land. So a lot of people in Mexico are, are a product of European, indigenous, and African mixing. Uh, that's why a lot of Mexicans you will see that have still have retained that brown skin color. Uh, Mexico did have an active slave trade since early colonial period, uh, but uh, from the beginning, intermarriage and mixed race offspring created an elaborate caste system. And it's also known fact that the Mexican city of, of Cibola was founded by a Spanish, uh, Spanish Moor named uh, Stephen the Black or Esteban El Negro. Uh, so in, in Veracruz, uh, Campeche, and Panuco, and Acapulco, uh, they were main port cities for the entrance of African slaves. And Mexican, Mexicans referred to the blacks as Morinos, meaning brown skin, and Blanquitos, which were light skin uh, Afro, Afro Mexicans. And they lived in the communities uh, related to African uh, cities, the states such as uh, Mozambique, uh, Carol del Congo, um, uh, short for Congo Hill, El Mulato, Guerrero, uh, Oaxaca, uh, Tabasco, Tabasco, like Tabasco sauce, and Veracruz. And so these, uh, in the 16th century, uh, Afro-Mexicans made up 71% of Mexican, of Mexico's population in the 16th century. Here we see pictures of Afro-Mexicans. You can see that they are darker than, than most Mexicans, Mexicans we see on TV or if you visit Mexico. And their hair textures are a little different as well. They have Afro-style uh, hairstyles, curly, uh, Negro-type hair. You can see here. So although the vast majority of... of uh, these Afro-Mexicans Afro have roots in Africa. Not all made the trip directly to America. Some went through Hispanic territory elsewhere at the time. Uh, African slaves and the brown-skinned natives of Mexico uh, were the first there before any Spaniard. Uh, Spaniards came and, and, and set up their uh, language, uh, their religion, and they and intermixed their uh uh, DNA for white skin into the native uh, people's DNA. And of course, uh, some of those people, offspring would have been lighter. Those from Africa uh, that came to Mexico belong mainly from uh, groups from people from Sudan and the Bantus areas. And so we know the origin of the slaves to various documents of uh, such as letters of sale. Originally, the slaves um, that were in Mexico came from the islands of Cape Verde and uh, rivers Guinea uh, later were also extracted from Angola and the Canary Islands. In regions in Mexico or in South America with significant populations of Afro-Mexicans uh, Afro are again uh, the Costa Chica of Guerrero, Costa Chica of Oaxaca, excuse my pronunciation, Veracruz in northern Mexico. I wrote books about the Afro-Mexicans as you can see here. A lot of people don't know about Afro-Mexicans. More pictures for you to see. As you can see, you can tell the, the race mixing. Uh, you can see the resemblance of the uh, what we normally see as me how Mexicans look. And also a little bit of black uh, in there too, as you can see. So the Afro-Mexicans... Um, just like a lot of black people in different areas are amongst the poorest in the nation. And many are shunted to remote shanty towns well out of the reach of basic public, basic public services such as schools and hospitals. And activists for Afro-Mexicans face an uphill battle for government recognition and economic development. They have long petitioned to be counted in Mexico's national census alongside the country's 56 other official ethnic groups. It's a little veil. Unofficially, the records put their number at 1 million. And in response to, uh, they had an activist pressure, Mexico's government released a study at the end of 2008 that confirmed that Afro-Mexicans suffered from uh, institutional racism. And they had employers that were less likely to employ uh, black Afro-Mexicans. And some schools even prohibited access based on their skin color. So even then, in, I mean, any, so like any country you go to, you're discriminated against what the darker your, your skin color is. Reading here, we're talking about um, the sale of slaves to Mexico. They, uh, to decide the six of slaves, they 
would send the new that they would send to the new world, which is the Americas. Uh, the slave traders had calculations that included physical performance and reproduction, and they tried to import half women and half men, but later realized that men could work longer without fatigue, and they yielded uh, similarly throughout the month. Uh, you know, good good work, unlike women uh, who oftentimes suffered from pain and diseases more easily. Uh, on this, they began importing a third of women by uh, a third of the women were uh, slaves. And from the African continent, uh, they extracted uh, dark-skinned slaves. The first true blacks were extracted from uh, Arguin and in the 16th century, black slaves came from different areas, uh, like I said, such as Cape Verde. Uh, the black slaves were classified into several types, depending on their abundance, origin, and mostly physical characteristics. And, uh, and like we talked about, the Sudan and the Guinea coast, uh, and different blacks, they all had different uh, skin color and hues, ranging from uh, light colored uh, to very dark. Moving along with uh, South uh, America, um, you see the Afro Ecuadorians. These are Ecuadorians, black people living in Ecuador, uh, descendants of uh, slaves that were brought there from Africa. Uh, Caraco, or Corkeo, the black people living here. As you can see, many of them were slaves from Ghana, 15,000 slaves, and many of them were Ashantis from the Ashanti tribe in Ghana. The rest of the slaves were imported from Senegal, Gambia, uh, about over 2,000 slaves in Sierra Leone, uh, Wimmer Coast, and Benin, even Angola. More than 38,000 Central African slaves were also exported to uh, Caraco. Rakeo, excuse my pronunciation. Here's a picture of the uh, the island of Krakow uh, off of uh, Venezuela in the Caribbean Sea. Here's you see pictures, and you can see the African features. It's, of course, they look just like black people in America and across the seas. Now. Uh, in their land, in, in 1795, a major slave revolt took place under the lead of the uh, Negroes Tula uh, Regard, Louis Mercier, and Bastian Arcapata, and Pedro uh, Wakeo. So up to 4,000 slaves on the northwest section of the island revolted. Over 1,000 of the slaves were involved in heavy gunfights, and the Dutch feared for their lives at the time. And after a month, the rebellion was crushed, however, by the Dutch. The Dutch... Uh, however, in, in 1863, abolished slavery, creating a change in the economy. When the institution was abolished in 1863, the island's economy was crippled because the slaves no longer did work for free. And so some of the inhabitants of the uh, uh, Caraco or Corqueo Islands emigrated uh, to other islands such as Cuba to work in sugarcane plantations. Some of the fl slaves had no place to go and remain working for the plantation owner in the tenant farmer system. Uh, this was an instituted uh, order in which the former slave leased land from his former master. In exchange, the tenant promised to give up most of his harvest to the former slave master. Um, he had to get his cut too, but he got more of a cut than what the slave got. And the system lasted until the beginning of this 20th century. Black Guyanese people. Uh, most of the slaves imported to Guyana. Uh, Guyana came from Ghana. Uh, and... Uh, Bite of uh, Biafra and Central Africa. Thousands of slaves also arrived from Senegal, Gambia, uh, and current uh, Sierra Leone. And so Afro Guyanese people make up about 30 to 43 percent of the population. Uh, during a time when, when the uh, Afro Guyanese people were slaves in Guyana, um, they of course helped uh, build the economy. There in Guyana, once slavery was abolished uh, in the European countries and, and it was made law, then they had to release the slaves, but they had nobody to till the field and do the slave labor that the blacks were doing. So then eventually they was able to get uh, people of Indian descent to come over to Guyana to be indentured servants, to be able to make money to send back to their families because uh, they were poor at the time. And from then, you saw a high influx of Indians in Guyana. Even to this day, 
if you talk to any black person from Guyana, he will tell you that the Indian population uh, over there is rich and they have a lot of money uh, amongst the Europeans that also uh, were there enslaving the blacks. And the blacks there in Guyana are at the bottom of the caste system, meaning they are the poorest. Even though they were brought there uh, originally first. There's an African slave named Cuffy. Um, has history um, with the Afro-Guyanese people. Cuffy led a slave rebellion uh, revolt in 1763. Here's a, uh, a statue of him right there. And we see pictures of the natives of uh well the native well the native Afri afro guyanese people in the streets and we also have french uh, uh guyana french guyana was uh an overseas department and region of france on the north atlantic coast of south america uh it bordered uh, brazil to the east and south and Suriname to the west afro french guyana people make up 42 to 66 percent of population blacks are termed mulatto uh, most of them are of African and French ancestry, composing a majority of Creole and Haitian people. Now you can see here it's right next to Suriname, which is mainly a, uh, Suriname is a Dutch uh, area with uh, black people as well. And next to it you have French Guyana, because of course the French controlled it. And below you have Brazil. Brazil has black people as well, controlled by. Uh, originally inhabited and colonized by the Portuguese, the Portugal, all from Europe. Here we see pictures. Uh, the French comes from, the French in the, in the word French Guyana comes from colonial times when five, co five colonies existed. Uh, the Guyanas were a collection of five colonies, namely from west to east. So you had the Spanish Guyana, which is now, which now is uh, currently Guyana in the region uh, in Venezuela. And you had uh, British Guyana, which was which is also currently now Guyana. Uh, you had Dutch Guyana, which is now Suriname, and you had French Guyana, which is still French Guyana right now. And you have the Portuguese Guyana, which was which is now uh, a Mapa or a state in far northern Brazil. So French Guyana and the two uh, larger countries to the north and west, uh, Guyana and Suriname, are still often collectively referred to as the Guyanas and comp uh, and comp uh, uh, compromise of um, of one large shield of landmass. The mulattoes, the Africans, or slash French ancestry people in the Guyanas are the largest ethnic group, and the Creole population there is judged to be about sixty to seventy percent of the total population. Um, if Haitians, uh, who compromise of one third of the Creoles, are included, if you remove the Haitians, then it's about thirty to fifty percent. And so roughly only 14% of the population now is of European ancestry. Uh, the majority are French, uh, though there are also people of Dutch, British, Spanish, and Portuguese ancest ancestry. And they also have Asian communities, uh, Chinese, uh, they make up about 3.2%. Uh, and smaller groups from the Caribbean islands, such as St. Lucia and Dominica. And then we talked about they had Asian groups such as East Indians and Lebanese and Vietnamese also as well. Um, but... Of course, uh, the main groups living there are black. Many that live in the interior are called Maroons, uh, formerly called Bush Negroes, and they are of African descent, and also the native, uh, also Amerindians. Indians. Um, the Maroons were also known as being descendants of escaped slaves, and they primarily lived along the Maroonie River. The main Maroon groups, black Maroon groups, are the uh, Saramaka, the Aukan, many of um, whom also live in Suriname, and the Boni or Luku. And the many Amerindians, Ameri Indians, which form about 3 to 4% of the population, are the Arawak, the Carib, the Amarillon, and the Galibi, now, now called the Kalina. So the Saramarkan people, the last uh, fearless, uh, largest maroon tribe in this area, you can see pictures of them right here. The Okupan people, the uh, maroon tribe, you can see their uh, African roots and their appearance and the way they dress. A Suriname people, uh, we talked about controlled by the Dutch. Um, they also have five main groups. We talked about the Yukons, the Qu uh, Quinti, the Matawai, and the Saramakans, and the uh, Paramakans make up about 30 to 40 percent of the country's population. And you can see here by the pictures, their African roots. 
So the afro Surinamese people are the inhabitants of Suriname of black African origin. They divide into two groups, the Creole people and the Maroons. The Suriname Creole people are the mixed race descendants of West African slaves and Europeans. And the Maroons were runaway slaves who, formerly, who formed independent settlements together and they maintain their African culture and language to this day. Uh, most of the slaves imported to Suriname came from Central Africa, 31%. Also the Shanti region of Ghana, 25%, and Benin, 16.4%. In Suriname also arrived thousands of slaves from Senegal and Gambia, uh, Sierra Leone, the Windward Coast, and Bight of Biafra. The Diuka people of Suriname descendants of African slaves. I see your pictures. And like we talked about, the slaves that were taken to the Americas and to the Caribbeans, uh, they, a lot of them were um, on slave ships owned by Jewish people. A lot of people don't know that, but uh, they know that. And here we see pictures here of the different people in South America, African people in the Americas also down in South America as well as North America. We here living in North America, uh, probably some of us probably had no idea that there were also slaves dumped off in South America. Still to this day, a large population of black people living in South America, and we think South America is all Latinos. Uh, Brazilian people, uh, if anybody has been to Brazil, they know there's, there's a, lot, a large number of people of color there. Um, they had a famous movie called The City of God that so I'm making out of Brazil, and if you watch the movie, you'll see a lot of people uh, look like just regular black people, but they're in Brazil speaking Portuguese, <clears throat> the language of the Europeans in Portugal. And it's a, one of the probably most famous movies from Brazil. If you ever get to watch it, you'll see some of the what goes on in, in, the, in the areas where blacks reside, similar to what blacks are going through in different cities and states in America and the different islands. Now, this is another interesting uh, group of people uh, that is almost like a mystery. Uh, the Nuristani people of Afghanistan. Uh, these people, and you would think, you know, most people think of Afghanistan and Pakistan and India, you know, having the same uh, uh, type of uh, look, the same appearance. Uh, but these people were that lived here are white in appearance very fair with uh, blue eyes and the origins of the present day Neurostani peoples remain, still remains a mystery although soldiers of Alexander the Great have been uh, implicated to give account of these people being here uh, physically the people favor Europeans uh, most of them have blonde or red hair and blue, and green, blue or green eyes and are seen more frequently uh, than the other Afghan people so when we think of Afghanistan and Pakistan we don't really uh, think of uh, people looking like this or looking like straight Europeans with uh, green eyes and blue eyes and blonde hair and red hair. Typical Afghan uh, standing people have uh, color and as you can see here uh, but uh, the Neurostani people as you can see, look Caucasian, and they have a high frequency of blue eyes. And here we show some examples of the different uh, ways that the skin colors have been affected by the Europeans, namely like the Greeks and the Romans and, and uh, uh, the Caucasian Muslims, Arabs. And as you can see, the North Indian woman uh, is fair complected compared to the South Indian woman. You see a North Indian family compared to a South Indian family. A North Indian man, uh, his skin color is more close to Caucasian appearance. And a South Indian man, whose skin color is mostly resembles an African. So we're going to continue to move forward and talk about... Uh, uh, in the Bible, what, what it, when it talks about uh, white skin, it always talks about the curse of leprosy. Uh, we know that there are different uh, deep pigmentation disorders or hypopigmentation disorders that causes one skin to be white. If you are originally uh, black and that's uh, vitiligo, 
Name, namely vitiligo, uh, albino, albinoism. And you have the biblical leprosy. However, in, in leprosy, uh, you know, it's different than the leprosy that we see today in, in, in medical books and medical teaching. So in the King James Bible, in Second Kings 5.27, uh, there was a man in Gehazi, and he was cursed. Uh, and it says here, the leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee, uh, meaning Gehazi, and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. So Gehazi was cursed with the, the disease of leprosy that Naaman had. And he went out from his presence as white as snow, and this was supposed to be unto his seed forever. And forever means forever, and forever means the, until the end of time. And so, you know, the curse back in those days were always, was always white skin, and it was known as leprosy. It never was the curse of having black skin. And if you look at also a passage in Exodus uh, 4, verses 6 uh, to 7, you'll see that says, And the Lord said unto him, to Moses, Put thy hand in thy bosom. And Moses put his hand to his bosom and took his hand out, and his hand became as snow. Now, this is the Greek Septuagint version of the Bible. Not the English version. This is the Greek version of this passage. And it says here that Moses put his hand to God's bosom. He took it out, and his hand became as snow. It didn't say his hand became leprous. It says his hand became as snow, meaning his hand became white. And Moses put, and God said, put your hand into thy bosom. And Moses put his hand to his bosom and he brought it out uh, out of his bosom. And then again, his uh, skin uh, was restored to the complexion of his other flesh. So right here in the Greek Septuagint version, it says that Moses had put his hand into God's bosom, took it out, his hand was white as snow, put it back in, took it out, and was returned back to the complexion that he normally had, which of course had to have been uh, black or brown because what would be the miracle behind uh, putting a white hand into the bosom and bringing it back out, and it's white, and it's still white. You know, that's not uh, a miracle if uh, a person's white hand continues to stay white after you tell them to take out the, uh, the bosom. Also, uh, in the Greek Septuagint version, in Numbers, it talks about um, Miriam. When Miriam saw that Moses had married an Ethiopian, uh, the Lord got mad, and uh, Miriam was turned leprous as white as snow. And so we see how um, the Europeans, you know, they threw in the word leprous here and then they, and they forgot to put it in here. And and so there's a lot of confusion going on. What You know, what, you know was was Moses' hand leprous or was it white as snow? Or was, was Miriam um, cursed with the disease of leprosy or was her hand or her body or her whole, uh, you know, everything was turned white as snow? But as we know, uh, according to the Bible, you know, she was turned as white as snow. So Miriam had not, uh, could not have been uh, white to begin with. There would be no miracle or no curse behind making your skin the same color or a little bit lighter than what you already are. So um, it's a known fact that um, black objects have the ability to absorb light and in turn radiate it. Uh, white objects don't do that. And this is this may be why the color white in the Bible has a very negative connotation. As we know, black uh, people with melanin uh, can stand out in the sun and work with no shirt on uh, and, and naked in the UV radiation of the sun. It could be even 130 degrees outside, but our bodies are uh, adapted to the sun. Uh, uh, and our skin has a natural protectant that protects our skin from the rays of the sun, no matter how hot it is or no matter how damaging the UV rays of the sun are. Uh, people with uh, uh, Caucasians with uh, white skin do not have this protection. There's another, another uh, uh, reason why God uh, would have made the original man uh, to be uh, able to withstand the sun because you know, God, the original man, would have been a superior being and not a being with uh, the types of defects and deformities and inferior. So here we see here the vitiligo. Everybody knows vitiligo is a, a depigmentation disorder. It causes one skin to turn uh, white. Uh, it's more pronounced in African Americans. Uh, Caucasians do get it on occasion, and it's, you really have to really pay attention to see the difference uh, in the depigmentation. But it's easily blended in 
uh, with cosmetics uh, easier than a black person trying to um, cover it up. And you know, there's no, there is a med- there's no medical disease that causes one skin to turn from white to black. There's no reverse vitiligo that causes white people's skin to turn black. There's only digment- deep pigmentation diseases. So in albinoism, you're born uh, with white skin and different color eyes, like blue eyes and red eyes and green eyes and blonde hair. There is no reverse al- albinoism that causes uh, white people to have black children. So you got to be black first, then turn white. Can't be the other way around because there is no genetic disease and no genetic uh, uh, defect or any type of um, disorder that causes your skin to go from white to black. And here we see pictures of uh, different albinos, and we'll see pictures of a regular Caucasian. And these are pictures of uh, albino Indian children. Um, it's very difficult for some people to tell, but if you can. Uh, Imagine color, you will see that these people are of Indian heritage. Some more pictures of albino Indians. Now, this child is um, amongst her uh, siblings and, and relatives, and she is an Indian albino, um, but yet her skin has been badly burnt by the sun. And as you can see here, she has uh, uh, blonde hair. A family of uh, Indian albinos, all with uh, white hair and white skin. And as you can see here, it, albinoism uh, affects uh, Asians, affects uh, Africans, uh, whites, even Native Americans. As you can see here, uh, people from, so- from uh, South America, North America. Here you have an albino child that uh, looks... Uh, Similar in appearance to a Caucasian child. Now, the trait for blue eyes is not only seen in Caucasians, it also is seen in ocular albinism, albinoism. And just like with albinoism, uh, you can see uh, people that are born with, uh, born with uh, white skin color. Uh, ocular albinism causes... Uh, deep, pigment, deep pigmentation of just the eyes so you can see somebody with black skin and they can have blue eyes as you can see here with this kid so ocular uh, albinism is an inherited condition in which the eyes lack melanin pigment while the skin and the hair show normal or near normal coloration melanin makes our hair brown black it makes our skin brown black and it also makes our eye color brown um, which is the most common uh Characteristics and features and traits of all mankind. If you look at all different regions and countries, you will see that the majority of people in this world have brown hair, brown eyes, and some form of shade of brown skin with the ability to tan. Here we see some pictures of ocular albinism. Different people, India, Africa, and they all have brown skin, but yet they have strikingly blue eyes. Like I said earlier, you have uh, also the, the characteristic trait of blonde hair. It's also exhibited by blacks uh, living in the Solomon Islands or the Melanesians east of uh, Papua, uh, Papua New Guinea. And they are very dark skinned, but you have puzzled scientists for decades with their blonde hair. And this is a homegrown gene that gives them blonde hair. And uh, it's different from uh, the Europeans. Its frequency is about 5 to 10% amongst them living there. And here we see the effects of UV radiation, uh, light from the sun, on people that lack melanin. With uh, you can see with, with uh, skin cancer and uh, sunburns. Or the skin is irritated and it's red, uh, and it's painful. This is a sign that the body is saying that something is not right and you need to stop doing what you're doing and get out the sun. Because if you continue to stay in the sun, then uh, the skin will get more irritated, more red, and it will start to peel and damage uh, and uh, eventually uh, could be a precursor for cancer. And then here we see, we've noticed, we've seen incidents of black, black uh, families, Africans and Brazilians and different people having albino children. 
and uh, vinyl children uh, are white in appearance. And the news, the news uh, uh, title may read that uh, uh, African family had a white child, but it's not really that he had a white child. It's that the child is white in appearance, but they're still African. They're just albino. And as you can see, you know, the Brazilian uh, a woman with uh, her children, five children, and uh, her husband is also black Brazilian as her, where her children are albino, white in appearance, uh, almost looking similar to what Europeans uh, look like with the hair and the skin color. So the question is, you know, did King James replace uh, albinism or albino uh, the disease with leprosy and you know, how did leprosy get there when we know that leprosy is not um, make somebody's skin white as snow uh, we know in different passages in the Bible leprosy made your skin white as snow but as you can see here uh, lepers living in India and Africa uh, do not have white skin they, it's like a, it's a granulomatous disease causes lumps and bumps and it causes uh, blindness and, uh, and the auto-amputation of limbs and fingers and legs. So when you read Numbers 12.10 and, and you read other passages in the Bible, you say, where is the uh, skin white as snow? So who has been tricking us? Have we been hoodwinked or bamboozled? Uh, you look at the hands of a leper here, a man from uh, Africa slash, or India. You can see the hands of a leper, his hands are now white. As in Exodus 4, 6, when God told Moses to put his hand in his bosom. And then we check it out, his hand in the King James Version, his hand was leprous as snow. But there's no white hands here on this picture. So somebody obviously was not telling the truth. Uh, maybe the le word leprosy was put in there by Europeans. And here we see leprosy on a white person's skin. And as you can see, it doesn't make the skin any whiter. It actually makes the skin red. Uh... If you go to any village in any third world country and ask to be taken to the village where the lepers are, you will find the people to be the same color as everyone else. No, you're not going to see a whole bunch of people as white as snow in the village full of, le uh, you know, like the Bible says. So the question is, who inserted uh, leprosy into the Bible and why doesn't it not make your skin white today? We know that they have... Uh, in Hawaii, they had a group of uh, lepers that had to be exiled to an island and uh, all the people over there were not white as snow. There's leper villages in India and Africa and many third world countries, but the lepers are not white as snow. And as I said, the, the lepers cause, leprosy causes this uh, uh, blindness of the eyes and, and auto amputation of limbs and granulomatous uh, lumps and bumps on the face and the skin, as you can see here. But their skin complexion has not changed to be white. So maybe King James, or maybe the original Bible did not have the word leprosy, and maybe it just simply stated that the curse of white, the curse of having white skin as snow, uh, was something else. As you can see here, more pictures of leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease in the medical terminology. So as we start to wrap things up, we see that. Um, we see a large uh, spread uh, evidence of uh, black people, or people of African descent, people of color, uh, all over the globe, in the Americas, North America, South America, Central America, Africa, uh, Asia, uh, India, uh, the Pacific Ocean Islands, uh, even in uh, the Middle East, Mesopotamia, uh, in Europe. These are the four corners. These are the four corners of the earth, which the Bible talks about uh, uh, his children being spread to. Now, whether they, some of them were spread there by captivity, whether some of them had uh, migrated there to escape persecution or captivity, uh, and they did so thousands of years ago, and they've been there ever since, even before Europeans even came to the land, uh, that's yet to be told and you know that's these are things that happened a long time ago we don't have all the research but we can see the evidence that uh, people of color have been in these uh, areas across the globe the four corners the east the west the south and north for over uh, centuries and millennials and this is uh, talked about uh, in the bible 
and in regards to uh, the children of Ham and the children of Shem and uh, God's chosen people. And in each area of the land, in different parts of the world, the people of color uh, have been suppressed and have been exterminated and have, have had eugenics practice against them and they're usually the poorest and they usually can't catch a break. And they're subject to uh, enslavement and persecution and suppression uh, so that they normally can't get ahead and get the bottom of the caste system. Is this a coincidence? I don't think so. Is this the curse of black skin? No, it's not the curse of black skin. Is this some other type of curse? Um, could it be uh, the curses of Israel? The um, Bible talks about that children of Israel will be in magnitude and numerous as the stars, and then eventually they will be uh, left few in number. And as we all know, uh, people of color, uh, through the different slave chains and captivity and, uh, and extermination processes and eugenics, um, by the Europeans have had their numbers uh, significantly uh, uh, decreased. Um, this is something that doesn't go on with European nations. And we all know it's been scientifically proven that the uh, sexual appetite of uh, the black man is, uh, is higher than none other than any other race in, in the world. And so we do know that people of color do know how to populate and they know how to be fruitful and multiply. And as we see here in uh, some of these ancient pictures in the 17, 1800s, uh, of the, right here, this picture of the Ashanti Levite. And we can see here the European settlers with the Ashanti, Ashanti Levite priest. We can obviously see that this man right here is uh, a black African, but yet he has on the same breastplate that it talks about in Exodus 39, 18, uh, with the four rows of three sets of stones, each signifying the 12 children of Israel. Now, it's not a coincidence. Even the European Jews know of the African uh, Hebrew Israelite connection, as you can see here, uh, with the Jewish man standing with uh, different Africans with the uh, uh, Jewish. Uh, uh, different relics in the back. African kings uh, back then, even now to this day. Uh, we all uh, need to know our history uh, and do the research. Uh, because uh, just because the Europeans labeled us African Americans or Brazilians or Suriname or Surinamese people or are uh, Iraqis, Iranians, or Melanesians, or Polynesians, or Tasmanians, or, or Australia Aborigines, we all uh, can trace our roots back even farther. So here, uh, in this uh, uh, part, we're going to uh, just give a quick uh, rundown of uh, something that's very uh, important right now and it's eventually going to be affecting all of us and this is just a little bit of a, a taste of what uh, you're going to have stored uh, in the future uh, with more uh, um, knowledge that's going to be released so In this uh, day and age, there's a lot of different um, technology, and um, now we have uh, um, biometrics. In the biometrics, uh, we have uh, microchips and uh, things like that in nature. But there's a thing a lot of people have been uh, talking about. It's called the uh, RFID chip. And the RFID chip um, has been developed. Uh, it's very small, and it's, could be u it's used in animals currently, and it's used in different products that we buy today and different things that we carry. And it's also been developed to be also used in humans. Um, originally, when they made the RFID chip, it was about the size of a grain of rice. And 
you know, they had they showed pictures of it compared to a, a dime or a grain of rice, so you can see the size is a couple of millimeters. Uh, and it actually has the components to uh, bind to tissue. Uh, this plastic piece right here at the top is designed to bond to human tissue and prevent the capsule from moving around once it's been implanted. And you, of course, all, all chips got to have some tor- some tor- sort of uh, antenna if you're going to communicate information and also an identification chip, which has everything, uh, information it needs to know about that person or, or that animal or that product. Now, in the Bible, you know, we all know in Revelations in 13, 16, 7, or causes where it talks about um, people, great, uh, small, rich, and poor, free and slave, receiving a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads so no one can buy and sell except for they take the mark of the beast or the number of his name. Now, for at least two decades, technolo- technologies have designed to target, they've been designed to target and examine human beings. Scientists are currently in the process of mapping out the entire brain into a computer Um and RFID chips are already here, and it's only a matter of time before these systems become widespread. Now, right now, or soon, people are going to most likely be going to be carrying these chips, if not one or a few, in which case, you know, they're transmitting a 15-digit number that identifies you. These numbers can be gathered by an uh, ISO compliance scanner, uh, but the fact is that they're all, all over. And they're, these chips are embedded in our clothing, our purses, shoes, and food, and phones, and, and more. And many say that there are certain stores that also implemented these chips into our everyday products. Um, major stores such as Walmart, Sam's Club, Target, Stop and Shop, CVS, Procter & Gamble, Kellogg's, Nestle, Sara Lee, Best Buy, Gillette, Coca-Cola, uh, uh, Johnson Johnson Pepsi Kraft and, and and one of the three other companies they all are currently in our uh, passports if you have a passport RFID chip is in your passport and you also can get it in special driver's license if you uh, if they ask you for it if you say yes I want a special driver's license that special driver's license has an RFID chip in it and they're also known to be in library books the RFID technology and uh, NFC technology which which uh, which uh, stands for Near Field Communication, is used um, right now in London uh, for people to make payments when they transport, when they go on buses and stuff like that, transit. And some people in London even know how to embed um, their RFID uh, NFC transit cards into their uh, phones. Their Android phones and, and iPhones, they can uh, kind of put their antenna and chip in their phone so that they can just do everything and pay for their, uh, when they get on the bus, they can pay with it that way. And so right now, currently, Android phones and Windows smartphones already possess this type of technology, NFC technology, and um, the Apple iPhones in the process of getting it next. And there's also talks of eventually uh, our phones going to be uh, uh, uh RFID capable. They're going to have RFID chips in them and they're going to have NFC technology so you can bump your phone to somebody else or you can bump your phone next to a, a scanner or bump your phone at the bus when you get on the bus or on a subway system and it'll handle the transaction for you and handle the money transaction. It'll be linked to your bank account or your credit card and everything will be taken out just in a split, of a split second. And this is a technology that's headed our way because that's uh, different technologies and different companies like Samsung and uh, Android and iPhones, uh, they compete against one another to uh, increase the technology. Eventually, we are going to have this technology in our phones, and we know that everybody carries a phone. Most of us can't live with our, without our iPhones and our technology, iPads and tablets and everything else. Uh, many many uh, eschatologists, and the eschatologist is somebody that, that studies uh the end of time, basically, or they study uh, the trends that man and human makes in regards to the last days or the the, the end of our uh, life as we see it or end of the world as we see it um, based on different types of factors. And so many of these eschatologists fear uh, the era of, this era of technology is going to lead us to uh, the market of beasts and possible DNA alteration, alteration into some sort of transhumanism. 
uh, just like the 2014 movie Transcendence, uh, played by the actor Johnny Depp. We already see people that have bionic arms and legs and feet and hands, and you know, soon they're going to start developing uh, bionic uh, organs or robotic organs that are, are going to replace uh, human organs. So it's going to be almost, in a sense, half robot, half human. And we're going to have uh, tons of surveillance and tons of chips and everything that we carry every day. So a few years ago, Americans rejected the idea of tracking devices, but now we've welcomed um, surveillance, surveillance and, and chips. Uh, we've welcomed the NSA and Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, you know, our smart, our smart devices and our phones all are used to uh, collect and observe data in our every move. Um, as you, most people know, uh, in fact, every iPhone very soon, like I talked about, will soon have an RFID chip embedded in it. Um, but a lot of times people, you know, people have said that, you know, they don't really necessarily have to tell you that it's a chip in your phone. They can just put it in there. Uh, just like you don't know what's in your smartphones and what's in your smart devices. Uh, a lot of them have cameras built in and microphones. So uh, we know that already these, these te technology, uh, tablets and phones and uh, TVs, they can pick up our location about GPS, so they know where we're at in the morning, noon, and night. And some of them even know what our appointments are or more. And so uh, there's different also reports that the cameras on the phone can also be remotely activated by law enforcement as surveillance systems. So even though it seems intrusive uh, to our lives, they are widely accepted as the norm. Maybe we feel more safe uh, with these gadgets and increases in technology. But we've become... Uh, the masters of our own enslavement and we pay a lot of money to do so but you know a lot of this was talked about and we failed to see the warning 16 years ago when Will Smith's Enemy of the State movie came out uh, everything that he went through then 16 years ago is, is currently what uh, uh, our government and the world is capable of now with satellites and, and all types of uh, x-ray scanners and chips so the way we are headed now, group with the continuous government deployment of surveillance suggests that RFID microchip technology will eventually be non-voluntary. So the question is, what would you do when you go to a grocery store and you can't buy food unless you have an implantable chip or a mark or a tattoo or some sort? Uh, they, they, they show us this in different movies like Total Recall, the, uh, the new Total Recall movie, the last one that came out. And... Uh, a minority, minority Report with Tom Cruise uh, put different tracking devices in your eyeballs and your hands and everything else. So, in you know, I'd like to talk about the new movie Transcendence with Johnny Depp, uh, 2014, basically uh, uh, touching on the point of transhumanism. And Will Smith's Enemy of the State touches on uh, uh, surveillance and tracking uh, that's going on to this day. Uh, it's all is leading us to in the book of Revelations where it talks about the mark of the beast and not being able to buy or sell without this mark or the number of the beast. Also with the increasing use of um, uh, technology and robotics into the health field, we have uh, become almost uh, or trying to be like gods. And a lot of people are uh, have the technology right now or, or the scientists and, and People in the medical field can actually grow uh, human parts, like human noses and human ears, using uh, tissue and 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 mouses and different things. And you know, even back in the day, they were using uh, uh, components of the pig to put into the heart for heart valves. But sooner or later, they'd be able to use mechanical, meaning uh, um, you know, uh, metals and different things. And so. Just like in Isaiah, where it talks about uh, what sorrow, it says, what sorrow awaits those who argue with the Creator? Uh, does the clay pot argue with its maker, or does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot, does the pot exclaim, how clumsy can you be? So how can the person that was created argue with the Creator? You can't, but we are starting to uh, decide for ourselves 
what the creator has done wrong. That's why we uh, manipulate our bodies and we alter our, our lips and our foreheads and our eyes and our and our chest and our breast and our butt and our calves and every part of your body can be changed. Uh, somebody does not like how God made them. Uh, we have the technology now and uh, the scientific ability to change that. Even if it means using uh, robotics. In Obamacare, uh, if you really read Obamacare, there's, there's a section where it's kind of um, points to an implantable, plantable device uh, under the Obama health care bill. It talks about a, a class two device that's implantable. And then on page 1004 in the Obamacare bill, it describes what the term data means in paragraph one, section B. Um, and when you uh, talk about electronic health records and uh, identity theft, and then you talk about implantable devices, you can only see where this is where it's headed. And as you can see here, uh, the RFID chips are a small, smaller than the actual, uh, small, smaller, I mean, so small that you can barely even see it. You could probably swallow it, smaller than a pill. And so small that it can be easily inserted into your hand. Uh, it's also on your credit cards. If you remove part of the credit card, you can see the RFID chip uh, underneath the plastic. And very small, even on, uh, you can put them on stickers that can go be uh, stuck to car doors or inside car doors. So, in regards to the Obamacare, supposedly the FDA approved this Class II implantable device, uh, which is an implantable radio frequency transporter system for patient identification and health information. Uh, so, in other words, the microchip that the so-called wackos have been warning you about is is supposedly written into law. Uh, and whether or not this be eventually becomes mandatory in the future or not will largely depend on public uh, backlash. Um, but recipients of Medicare and SSI, anybody uh, that's on the government system will likely uh, be strongly encouraged to participate, uh, if not required as a condition of care. Um, whenever the government is providing you with, with, a, with something, then the government has the right to tell you what you need to do in order to keep that. Uh, whether it's take a drug test or whether you got to do this, or do that. If you don't comply, then the government has the right to drop your insurance. So, and most, a lot of people are worried and scared that most people at some point will voluntarily have to, you know, uh, once they switch to Obamacare, will have to uh, take on whatever types of policies that it comes along with it. Uh, right now, you know, they, the main policies is, is the outrageous premiums and co-pays and deductibles uh, that people are going through right now. But eventually, uh, we don't know if the Obamacare will eventually switch over to an uh, electronic system where everything will be basically recorded and uh, uh, collected and be in you instead of a card. And this also goes for infants as well. Um, they have this thing called, uh, a lot of people talk about the Children's Health Insurance Program uh, called CHIP. And uh, CHIP is ironic because then, you know, a lot of people saying that babies are going to start being chipped. Um, but we have yet to see if this is going to happen. So if we don't wake up, uh, you know, sooner or later we're going to find ourselves on the verge of receiving something similar, if not the same as the mark of the beast. Uh, by then, you'll uh, see, people will see well, which God they'll be showing their allegiance to. And as you can see here, this is uh, kind of a scary picture of somebody receiving the mark and having a stereo stripped where they was placed at. So, in... Um, Conclusion uh, is a in the movie uh, The Matrix. Uh, it's the scene where Mor Morpheus uh, is talking to Neo, and Morpheus says that the Matrix is everywhere. It's all around us. Even now, it's in the very room. He says that you can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your, your television. You can feel it when you go to work. When you go to church, when you pay your taxes, it is a world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. And so Neo says, what truth? And then Morpheus says that you are a slave. 
unlike everyone else, you were born into bondage, into a prison that you cannot taste or see or touch, a prison for your mind. And so Morpheus says uh, to Neo that he's, that I'm trying to free your mind, Neo, but I can only show you the door, and you're the one that has to walk through it. So uh, a lot of a lot of the information that has been said, uh, we have to remind ourselves that uh, everything that we are being told is not always the truth. And throughout history, the truth has been manipulated, has been changed, and has been swept under the rug or eliminated for a reason. Uh, because the truth is powerful, powerful, and the devil and Satan does not want mankind to know the whole truth. Uh, a lot of times it's hard for people to adjust uh, and accept the truth when they're being shown the truth because their body, their uh, body, their whole uh, self has been taught for so many years uh, lies that it's hard to break uh, uh, the teaching uh, that they have received. But at some point, uh, you know, people are going to have to start waking up. And uh, one voice can make a difference, uh, but a million people can change the world. And if we don't uh, start to ask questions and start to search for the truth and ask for the truth uh, and research for the truth, uh, then we're going to constantly be in a state of darkness, a state of blindness that the powers that be want us to uh, stay in. Uh, just like uh, sheep, uh, sheep depend on the master. The master gives the sheep everything the sheep needs. Uh, and the master teaches the sheep and it teaches the dog and everybody else uh, that's under him everything that he needs to know. And so the sheep are easily led to the slaughter. Uh, as human beings, we can talk and we can rational, rationalize and think. And we can come up with conclusions and we can do research. Uh, but... Sometimes we, a lot of us, we just tend to believe everything we hear and accept it as truth. And so what I urge everybody to do is to, uh, when they hear something that uh, goes outside the norm or what they've been taught, just to uh, listen with an open mind. Uh, uh, and at the end of uh, listening, whether it's to an uh, audio or reading a book or, or watching a DVD, to uh, listen with open mind or watch with open mind and, and come up with your own conclusions on whether or not you want to believe it or not and whether you're going to use that knowledge to uh, change your life. 